you guys will find an interesting presentation on AFib and the maze procedure, uh, which we do a lot of here at Health Park. I'll just make sure I got you set up here. So. By way of disclosure, uh, we use a lot of Atricure uh, devices to do mazes, which is the ablation for AFib, and uh, I'm a consultant for them and do teaching for them uh, for surgeons and other students. Uh, so basically, all I, I'm going to talk to you about is how we take care of AFib in our practice and in the cardiac surgical world. And it's based on the maze procedure, which you probably have heard of, which is a surgical ablation, which was the original ablation for AFib, which was started back in the 1980s. Um, and I'll go through a little bit about atrial fibrillation and then what the maze procedure is and how we conduct it. And then I have some interesting uh, pearls on how we do some of the procedure, especially from a perfusion standpoint. So. See, it's running a little slowly right now. So as you probably know, uh, AFib is an irregular heartbeat. And my, it's not coming up at all. No, it's just whole, the whole slide's missing. It was just running. There we go. Uh, so AFib is Basically, what you see here on the left, sinus rhythm, where the heartbeat is normal between the atria and, or synchronous between the atria and the ventricle, but in AFib, the atria is not beating, it is fibrillating. And you can see here, this is basically what you see looking at the heart, where you see sinus rhythm, the atria beats first, then the ventricle beats after it's filled. But with AFib, it is not beating at all, it's fibrillating, and the ventricle is unable to fill properly and many patients have significant symptoms from this. Uh, and we classify AFib by essentially its chronicity. And paroxysmal AFib is sort of the most benign version or sort of when it starts out. And that's essentially when it terminates spontaneously. It doesn't last very long. Uh, when you get into situations where patients have atrial fibrillation, uh, where it's lasting uh, longer than a few days, it needs cardioversion or other sorts of uh, interventions to stop it, uh, or it can't be stopped, then it's called persistent AFib. Uh, that's the, those are the patients that we see the most for surgery. And then longstanding persistent AFib is essentially people or patients who've had AFib for over a year. <clears throat> and then some of the things you might hear about a permanent AFib also, permanent AFib is really our term uh, that we made up uh, when we say uh, we're not going to treat it anymore, we're not going to try to do anything about it anymore. It's permanent. Uh, and we're stopping all attempts at trying to restore sinus rhythm. And there's various reasons why someone would have permanent AFib. Uh, and then what you see in some of the guidelines is when we talk about uh, and some of the medications that are approved for certain, uh, certain anticoagulants is uh, non-valvular AFib or valvular AFib. And essentially when you're talking about what valves AFib is related to, it's really about the mitral valve. And non-valvular AFib is AFib that is not related to the mitral valve because the mitral valve and AFib really go hand in hand. The majority of maze cases that I do are patients who are coming in for mitral valve surgery as well or they're coming in for a maze and happen to have uh, significant MR as well. So valvular AFib is, is, um, is a common term that you'll see. And patients often wonder why do they have AFib, and there are a lot of etiologies of AFib. Uh, Non-cardiac ones robbing a lot around the lungs. We see it very commonly in people with lung problems, but also other things that cause your chemical imbalance, whether it's uh, endocrine, hyperthyroidism, or catecholamines, drugs and alcohol definitely related to it, um, and other electrolyte imbalances. A lot of this stuff we see in the hospital and post-op patients. And then the cardiac etiologies are also very common, as you know. Uh, Post-cardiac surgery uh, happens up to about 40% of the time in patients that get post-op AFib. So post-op AFib is something that we deal with every single day in the hospital with various medications and things like that. The good news is that post-op AFib, if you did not have AFib preoperatively, essentially is goes away in probably 98% of patients. So post-op AFib, fortunately, in most cases is short term, assuming they truly did not have it preoperatively. But we see it a lot in valvular heart disease, see it in coronary disease, cardiomyopathies, pericarditis, there's 
any problem with the heart is going to get associated essentially with atrial fibrillation. And AFib, as you can see from these etiologies, is a complex arrhythmia, and it's not so easy to take care of. You really have to look at each patient individually and kind of determine what was the etiology and how is it going to be treated. So it's not like some, some other arrhythmias that have a single foci, and you can ablate them, and they do great, WPW coming to mind. Uh, with AFib, it's coming from all over the place, most of the time out of the pulmonary veins, but not necessarily. And so it has a single name, but a lot of variance to it. And along with those variants is a lot of consequences of having AFib, stroke and heart failure being the top ones that people hear about. Uh, but it really has to do with loss of hemodynamics, uh, loss of the atrial kick that we call it, uh, and also the prothrombotic state where you have an atrium that is not beating, it is only fibrillating, and you have a lot of stasis and blood flow. And that is a big problem when you have a left atrial appendage because that is a blind sac and that's where the clots build up. Essentially, almost all strokes from AFib come from the left atrial appendage. So as you can imagine, that's been a target for therapy as well besides ablations. It is associated with increased mortality, hospitalizations, cost, you name it. AFib is not a good thing to have. Uh, and it's becoming more common. Uh, there's a, a, probably at least a few million people that we know about in the U.S. that have it, and that number is probably going to double with the aging population over our next generation. So you're going to see a lot of patients coming in, I'm sure you already have, uh, whether they're being treated for it or not, with AFib. Unfortunately, many patients are diagnosed with AFib when they arrive to the emergency room with a stroke. Uh, so it's not good, and it's becoming more common. It's very costly for society. And if someone has AFib, you try to determine what is their risk of stroke. The indications for anticoagulant therapy are based on this. And the most common scoring system used is called the chads vas score. And essentially what it does is it calculates your risk of thrombosis or thrombotic emboli uh, and stroke uh, based off of your uh, risk factors and things like diabetes and age, uh, being female, um, a history of stroke, these all add up to what is a surprisingly high number when you talk about your annual rate of stroke after, uh, after you, when, once you're diagnosed with AFib. Uh, and you can see from these numbers, it doesn't take long before you're adding up into the high single digits for an annual risk of stroke from AFib. And you calculate that over the lifetime of a patient. The average patient with AFib probably has about a 30% lifetime risk of stroke. So it's pretty devastating, very scary for patients. And when I give talks about all different kinds of heart, heart surgery problems, the ones that get filled up the most are the talks on AFib by patients. Uh, it's very common and people are very interested in it. And unfortunately, they're not always being optimally treated either. But this risk of stroke is, is real, especially if you're talking about over 10, 25, 30 years of someone's lifetime. Uh, so again, looking at this slide here, you see you know, sinus rhythm is a normal normal rhythm in the heart where the atrium and ventricle are synchronized between the SA and AB nodes. AFib does not have SA node function. And the maze procedure essentially sought to identify these pathways that you need to restore sinus rhythm and essentially corral it and put ablation lines in certain locations where you can block the foci or rotors that cause AFib and allow the sinus node to do its job. and, and transmit the impulse down to the AV node and get uh, normal sinus rhythm again. And if you look at a posterior view of the heart, uh, this is why it's called the maze, is that it's pretty complicated uh, for to do a full maze. This is a relatively complicated uh, ablation line set, but it's what you need to do to absolutely ensure that you've essentially attacked every location that the AFib can be coming from. So you see here the pulmonary veins are isolated. You have an isolation up to the left atrial appendage. The left atrial appendage is removed. You have another line that goes what we call the mitral isthmus near the, near the annulus of the mitral valve. You have right-sided lesions as well up and down the, the SVC to IVC. You have lines that go over to the tricuspid valve and up to the right atrial appendage. So there's a lot of lines involved, but that's what you need to get sinus rhythm restored. And in the OR, we're fortunate that we have very good devices to accomplish this, as opposed to the limitations when you're dealing with something over a wire in the EP lab, these devices are big. And the ablation lines that these can do, the cryoprobe on the left here and the RF clamp over here, uh, you're talking five to 10 centimeters of a line that you can do in just a minute or two. So uh, you can ablate a lot of tissue very quickly in the operating room. Uh, and then 
if you look at this device in the middle, this is the what we use most commonly now, but there are other devices out there. This is the atrial clip, or the clip that we put on the left atrial appendage. That is essentially a noose that goes around the base of the left atrial appendage, and it not only obliterates the left atrial appendage, but it also electrically isolates it almost immediately. So hopefully these videos will play. So this is the lesion set, and this is a great app that you can get on your phone from this website, Act Against AFib. But basically, you can just kind of spin the heart around. And this gives you a much better view than that static picture of where these lines really exist. And you can see the, the pulmonary veins in the back there are isolated, the line down to the mitral isthmus there, the left atrial appendage there with the black and white line on it. Uh, so it kind of goes all around. And then on the right side, you have the, um, the right atrial appendage line and the intracable line there, and then lines over to the uh, tricuspid valve. So, it's a fair amount of work, and in the 80s and 90s, when really the only real technology you had to do this was cut and sew and a little bit of cryo, uh, as you can imagine, that was a pretty big operation. Not many people were being referred for mazes, although it was highly effective, and the results, which I'll show you, are outstanding. Um, but cut and sew method for this number of lines is a big operation. Uh, and so not many people were referred for it. Uh, over the years, the technology has improved to do this minimally invasively and in some cases off pump. And we are getting the same results that they were back then, but without the massive operation that this, that this involved. Uh, and again, talking about the left atrial appendage, this is an excellent illustration of essentially where it sits near the mitral valve. And it's a blind sac. And it is not good to have a blind sac there. Uh, and within it, when you have AFib, uh, thrombus is pretty, can be very commonly built up, and that is why the anticoagulants are prescribed, which will essentially cut your risk in half. Uh, but thrombus is not uncommon whether you have a massive one like that or not. It does not take much of a clot to go north and, and cause a stroke. So these are ones that, one of the things that we're trying to avoid. And this is the, the atrial clip that we use. You can see here it's on the outside of the heart. A big advantage of having a device or a staple line or whatever you choose to use to get rid of left atrial appendage in the operating room is that it's on the outside of the heart. And given that, as you can see on the right image, the inside of the heart where the blood is flowing does not see a foreign body. This is a huge advantage of devices and staplers uh, like this. Um, over the Watchman device, which is a large device that sits within the left atrial appendage and is exposed to the bloodstream, which requires anticoagulation afterwards and has, another, has a host of other issues with it. So we've found, and our referrers have found, that this has been a highly effective uh, device for preventing stroke. Um, the patient does not, need, does not need to be anticoagulated before or after the procedure at all, not even during the procedure if it's going to be an off-pump application. So in patients who have had strokes, especially from, or I'm sorry, cannot take anticoagulation because of um, bleeding, either a head bleed or a GI bleed, and who are at high risk for stroke, uh, this is a great option because they don't have to worry about going on, an, on any anticoagulant even for the duration of the procedure. Uh, this is what the clip looks like, kind of uh, just sitting on the table. So I'll give you a, a video here of us putting it on off pump. And this, this video is good because it shows you exactly what the appendage looks like during AFib. So this is a left VATS approach where we're going with the camera and the heart's, you know, we're off pump clearly. And uh, we can just slip this clip on there and kind of nuzzle the appendage in there. You can see that is it truly fibrillating there while the ventricle is beating behind it. And this does not require any anticoagulation. Uh, we do it with TE, obviously, to make sure we're on where we need to be. And the appendage sort of just finds its way in there. Uh, we, it's about a three or four port technique. And uh, we check and make sure that it's seated down at the base of the appendage. And uh, then we just release the clip. And it's sort of a spring-loaded uh, piece of metal covered in fabric. And it just sits there on the outside of the heart. We really haven't had any complications with the clip long term. It just sits on the outside there, and there you can see it positioned well at the base. We check both sides. And then it's hemostatic, and you can just open it up and uh, decompress it if you choose to. Not necessary. Uh, but uh, it just goes to show that it's, it is on there, and it's not coming off. Uh, and you can even look inside. Fortunately, there's no clot in there. We, we confirmed that beforehand, obviously, on TE. But uh, it's a relatively, that procedure, which is not a maze procedure, it's just the clip, uh, it's a relatively easy operation. That would be a case where the patient had permanent AFib. We were, not, we were choosing not to treat the AFib, but we wanted to reduce the risk of stroke. Uh, 
Uh, so we just put the, we just get rid of the left atrial appendage. Uh, so when we talk about doing the maze operation, this, uh, this ablation procedure, surgical ablation procedure for AFib, uh, right now there are two options. There's an on-pump version and an off-pump version. Uh, most, of the, most of the cases are done on pump, and most of those cases are done concomitantly, usually with mitral valve surgery. Those are the ones you probably see in the operating room the most. Uh, but there are more and more patients referred now for standalone procedures, which are single stage procedures where essentially you set up the case like a mitral, and you're going into the left atrium and also into the right atrium, uh, but you're not doing the valve, you're just doing the ablations, the ablation lines that you need to do for the AFib. Uh, so from a surgical standpoint, the stuff in the operating room that you need to get the operation done, the retractors, how you'd set up perfusion with your cannulation techniques, things like that, it's, it's essentially a mitral approach, uh, but you don't need to, you're not working on the valve. Those are the two ways that, that we uh, do it on pump. And off pump is the VATS approach where you just kind of saw that video there. That's part of it where you are doing an epicardial ablation off pump, and it's a two-stage approach and then the EP uh, cardiologist will go in usually about six to eight weeks later from, from the inside with a catheter ablation and map it and finish up what you started. And there is pluses and minuses to, to both of those approaches. I'd say in our practice it's probably half and half standalone um, on pump and, and VATS hybrid maze for the, for the standalone uh, maze operations. Probably with, with us, we have maybe three times as many patients who get mazes who are concomitant. So concomitant mazes with AFib is very closely related to structural heart disease, and that's where we see it most commonly, especially with mitral valve surgery. But all these cases, fortunately, whether it's standalone, VATS, mitral valve surgery, at least in our hands, um, we can do minimally invasively with a right mini thoracotomy or a bilateral VATS approach. Not everyone does it this way, and I think the most important thing, as long as the patient tolerates it, is that the ablation gets done, the operation on the inside gets done. But it is an option in certain centers for patients to have these procedures done minimally invasively. These techniques, minimally invasive, uh, the techniques where uh, you have, you, you take advantage of the technologies out there to do these ablations that way, is what is bringing patients into the operating room for more mazes, no question about it. And that's why the EP stuff took off, because they were trying to do the same thing we were doing without any incisions on the chest. And uh, the, make, make no mistake, the less invasive you make a procedure, the more patients you're going to get in for that procedure, because many patients are terrified of undergoing open heart surgery. And unfortunately, that results in patients not getting treated for their disease and then having heart failure and stroke. So I think that developing a program, not just surgically, but also with the EPs, where you offer many different options, including minimally invasive options, really is going to benefit everyone uh, regionally, or patients regionally, because you're going to have referrers send those patients in more and more for the procedure that needs to get done. This is a picture of the hybrid, uh, the VATS maze setup, where we essentially use four ports and a camera. Uh, it's done um, on both sides, the left and right side of the chest, typically, although some people do it just on the left. Uh, but it's a VATS approach. And then another common question, uh, the candidates, who are we operating on? When we work closely with the EPs, when we're looking at who is going to be a candidate for a maze or an ablation or whatever kind of ablative treatment we're talking about for AFib, we're really concentrating on symptomatic patients. There are a lot of patients out there who have AFib uh, who are not symptomatic. They're playing tennis every day and they're doing fine. They've had AFib for 25 years and for whatever reason, their body can handle it, and that's fine. And we really aren't looking for patients like that, not at this point anyway. Um, the patients we're talking about are patients who have, especially in the surgical arm, uh, per persistent or long-standing persistent AFib that is symptomatic, uh, meaning they have fatigue, palpitation, shortness of breath typically. A lot of times they have mitral regurgitation along with it. Uh, these patients really have been They've been sort of just dragging along in the medical offices on various medications, and they're just not doing well. And a lot of times it's the spouse that will tell you because the onset of these symptoms can be pretty insidious. And really they don't realize how good they could feel till after the procedure when they tell you they feel like they're 20 years younger because they've been struggling with the disease for so long. Um, another one that we see actually are not just the effects of the disease process, but the side effects of the medications that are being prescribed to try to control the disease process. And we have patients who come in in sinus rhythm, uh, but they're on just a large amount of medications. Their resting heart rate's 40, and that's the only thing that's keeping them in control. And they, they describe themselves as walking around like a zombie. 
And so you have these patients that are essentially over-medicated too. So either way, you have patients with pretty poor quality of life looking for an answer. And these patients have really benefited a lot because our goal is not just to get patients back in sinus rhythm, but to get them off the medications. And then, as I mentioned, we have a fair number of patients, especially in the elderly, who uh, cannot take anticoagulants. Um, not necessarily they don't necessarily need a maze procedure, but they certainly need the left atrial appendage addressed uh, because once you go off anticoagulation and you have a fib, your risk of stroke essentially doubles. It's not good. Uh, so these are patients that we see a lot of times uh, for, if not a maze, certainly at least a clip. And the common questions that come up are, you know, if you've had previous heart surgery, can you have these procedures done? And absolutely, and that can be done minimally invasively. Uh, how long uh, is too long with AFib? And there isn't a set number on that. I would say once you get up to 20 years, probably it's not going to help you. Uh, but, uh, you know, we look at the size of the left atrium and other factors with patients, and it's surprising. Even patients who've had AFib for five, eight years can have a pretty small left atrium, which usually you would think would dilate out. Uh, so, uh, really, we look at each case individually, and time or length of AFib is not necessarily an absolute contraindication, and it is very common with concomitant valve surgery. Uh, so, when we talk about our minimally invasive approach or my minimally invasive approach, whether it's a VATS off pump or a minimally invasive on pump, you're looking, you know, it's a real operation. These clamp times on these mazes, uh, a standalone on pump maze, is about 60 minutes. So, that's as long as any other valve. Uh, but you really have to take your time and make sure these lines are done just right. Because unlike a valve repair or replacement, if you have a trivial uh, paravalvular leak, let's say, uh, you know, you can't tolerate that with AFib. If just a little bit, if there's a tiny break in any of these lines, the AFib will recur. So the lines absolutely have to be complete. And it takes time to make sure you have all the folds of the heart out of the way and you really get a complete line, you overlap areas. Uh, it has to be done perfect. Uh, so it's, you'll, you'll end up with about you know, a 60 minute uh, clamp time on these operations and maybe a 70 or 90 minute pump run. Um, but most patients should be able to tolerate that just fine. They're gonna be in the hospital for a few days, but especially with minimally invasive, you know, as far as the wounds are concerned, it's about a two week recovery and we take them off all uh, limitations after that. How long it takes them to feel better will vary. Some patients feel better the minute they're back in sinus rhythm. Other people just have to get over the operation a little bit longer. Other people are very deconditioned for a long time. You know, it can take months for really deconditioned patients to get strong enough that they feel like they've gotten better. Uh, we usually restart their meds. Antiarrhythmics usually, depending on their heart rate afterwards. Blood thinners usually. Um, if they weren't on them in the beginning, we probably don't restart them. Um, sometimes the blood, there's no indication or no guideline in the U.S. yet about when to stop anticoagulation after you do any ablation. Uh, but on an individual basis, a lot of cardiologists, I would say in, in our practice, probably about half of the cardiologists and these patients who have shown no evidence of recurrent AFib are taking the patients off anticoagulation within a year. But the important thing to success with this, more so than anything else that we do, is a very close follow-up. Uh, and if there is a recurrence of AFib, uh, you do have the option of an EP mapping and ablation because if there is a recurrence in AFib in these cases, it's usually going to be a very small area that needs to be touched up uh, endocardially by an EP uh, cardiologist. So the follow-up is very important, especially if you're talking about patients you've taken off of anticoagulation, and if they do have a recurrence, you want to make sure that you capture it. So uh, it also helps in the success rate of the program because um, sometimes patients need medication adjustments and things like that, and non-compliance and lack of follow-up is absolutely associated with worse long-term outcomes from any of these procedures. But I will tell you, the long-term outcomes are excellent for the maze procedure. And this is one study uh, out of Virginia at the time, uh, which is a reflection of essentially all the longer-term studies out there with the maze procedure. And these are patients who had, who were average age in the mid-50s, who had AFib on average for four years and had a five centimeter atrium, which is a pretty large left atrium. But even going after three years, they were in the 90 something percentile of uh, being out of AFib. And you know, over 80% of them, or about 80% of them were off their medications as well. So this is a huge success rate. You're not gonna find success numbers like this in any other technology except the surgical maze. Because it's only the surgical maze that can give you that complete of an ablation. When you're talking about patients who have AFib, you know, for an average of four years. The AFib is way out of the pulmonary veins at that point, and it is all over the back of the heart. 
in those atria, both sides typically. So you really need to address all of that. And that's why the maze procedure has been successful because it hits every, every area where the AFib gets started. The EPs are very good at isolating the pulmonary veins, which works fine in paroxysmal AFib very early on, but it does not have nearly the success if you're talking about patients who have persistent AFib because it's outside of the pulmonary veins, and that's what you would expect. So the technologies are all worthwhile. It's a matter of really choosing what is going to be the best one for the particular patient. Uh, and a big thing with the patients, uh, besides staying out of AFib, is stroke. And when we look at the stroke rates, the longest term study that we have looking at stroke was out of actually one of the original cohorts of patients uh, from the 90s that were followed long term, out 15 years, and their freedom from stroke was 99%. And if you remember, I talked about the CHADS VAS score and what their annualized stroke rate should have been, you can calculate, and you know, this slide sort of puts it in a different perspective, but of that cohort of patients that they had operated on back in the 90s, they should have had 68 strokes in that cohort of patients based on their CHAD score and uh, how long they were followed in all those patients with AFib, uh, but they observed only one stroke. It really tells you that the procedure saves people strokes, there's no question about it. Uh, now, not all, if you go back to the other slide, you know, only a little over half of them um, we're, we're off anticoagulation, but the important point to remember is that all these patients had left atrial appendage closed. So at 15 years, I wouldn't necessarily expect everybody to be in sinus rhythm, but once you get rid of the left atrial appendage, it's gone. And this is just more of the evidence that really supports the benefit of getting rid of the left atrial appendage to reduce long-term stroke. We're seeing this with all kinds of cohorts of patients, but in the AFib maze cohort, it really is pretty dramatic to go from 68 predicted strokes to one. Uh, so it is very effective at that. So with AFib, in conclusion, essentially, it's, it's becoming more common. It's already very common. It causes a lot of trouble. Uh, but because of our improved technologies from uh, all kinds of arenas, the perfusion technology, one of them, but certainly the ablative tools that we have to do these things minimally invasively, we've been able to essentially get the same results without necessarily the same uh, magnitude of operation. And uh, it's clearly very treatable. Uh, one of the things I want to show you is, and it comes up with our perfusionist, is when we're doing the maze procedure on pump, uh, how we manage the right atrial approach. And I'll have a video I'll show you where we do a minimally invasive uh, maze, or a mini right thoracotomy, and we're able to unbypass, open the right atrium with vacuum assist without snaring either the IVC or the SVC, and the, uh, the procedure goes and we flow just fine. It's very helpful for a couple reasons because uh, I can do the ablation up the IVC and the SVC line without having snares in the way and having to fiddle with those. I can just get the full, what we call intercable line complete without snares in the way. And uh, plus, it's just not necessary to do extra dissection. Every time you're going around these big blood vessels, eventually someone's going to make a hole in something. So uh, if it's not necessary, try not to do it. But I'll show you. This is a video of a right chest on pump maze. You can see this, it's a right mini thoracotomy approach. Uh, we use the Medtronic Biomedicus multi-stage femoral venous cannula, and I like it because it has holes up and down the entire end. So it's not just an SVC and IVC hole, but the holes in the middle that are in the right atrium really help to keep the blood at bay, and we can see what we're doing. So when we start here, you see the, this one's a 25 French. The, the right atrium is very well decompressed. We turn vacuum off so that when we open it, we don't cut into anything. This particular patient had pacing wires in place, so we certainly want to avoid those, but we turn the vacuum off temporarily. We have no snares on the IVC or SVC. We put the vacuum back on, and then it will decompress back down, and essentially we'll have no blood loss. This is me trying to find the cannula, I mean the, uh, the, uh, the lines in a minute. I mistake the arterial line for the venous line here, but fortunately we have a great team who points out the venous line uh, to me. But you can see here that uh, there, there's some air in there, but not much. And our guys float just fine, and they can really titrate the amount of vacuum just right. And then this is the cryoprobe going on. Uh, and this is a, a, a line where we freeze between the opening there, which is near the AV groove, down to the tricuspid annulus. And you can see here, really, we're running vacuum assist. There's no blood coming out of that atrium. And then we have the RF clamp, and I can slide this clamp up and down the IVC and SVC without having to worry about snares in the way, and we can complete our intercable line that way. Uh, so it really allows us to do the operation uh, with 
fewer steps, more efficiently, and it's perfectly safe. And we've, we've been able to run uh, our pump uh, with vacuum assist with an open right atrium uh, all the time. The only time that I'll put snares on is really if there's so much back bleeding that I just can't see what I'm doing. Uh, and usually that case is when we're doing a tricuspid. There can be a little bit more blood in the atrium at that point. You can see I really didn't need to get inside the atrium much other than sticking the instruments in there. Uh, on the tricuspid, sometimes I'll put an extra sucker down there, or occasionally if it's a lot of backflow, uh, then um, we'll snare something. But we do whatever we need to do to get the operation done without any extra steps. So anyway, that's about it on the maze uh, and the perfusion aspects, of which I think are very interesting. And uh, thank you very much, and uh, ready to take any questions.